Hey, this is Sketchy. We're a learning company and this podcast is a review of the material meant to be used in tandem with our videos, quizzes, and symbol explorer to help the lessons stick. Or use this to passively review a topic while you're on the go. Check out the link in the episode bio to watch the video that goes with this podcast. All right, let's get started. Well, hello there. I'm Ricky J. And I'll be your auditory shaman on your vision quest that is pathology. Now just listen to the sound of my voice as I guide you into the heart. Not the cheesy metaphorical heart that's the crux of will and love. Because it's a muscle and that would be crazy. Ischemic heart disease is a pretty broad term that encompasses a range of syndromes, both acute and chronic. There's going to be one uniting theme throughout this chapter, though. A mismatch between myocardial oxygen demand and coronary oxygen supply. It's all about oxygen. You see, just like a medieval forge needs that sweet, sweet flow of oxygen in order to keep the flame going, just look at that thing glow. Cardiac myocyte function is dependent on a constant flow of oxygen provided by the coronary arteries. In fact, cardiac myocytes generate energy almost exclusively through oxidative phosphorylation, hence the oxidative forge. These myocytes extract a higher percentage of oxygen in passing blood than any other tissue in the body. They just soak it up. On an exam, they might even ask you something like, which vein has the most deoxygenated blood? The answer is the coronary sinus. That's where all the blood ends up after the cardiac myocytes are done extracting oxygen. During times of physical exertion, like a marathon, for example, or if you're like me, a strenuous walk between my refrigerator and the ongoing League of Legends match on my gaming PC, though it's more of a kind of shuffling, rolly chair roll... Look, who are you, my mom? Anyways, that extra surge of sympathetic activity to the myocytes causes increased heart rate and contractility. And that means a several-fold increase in myocardial oxygen demand. The only way to meet that demand is to increase blood flow. See that big dilated red exhaust pipe? Think of it as a coronary artery. Maintaining the proper flow of oxygen to the forge that is your cold, stony medieval heart. To increase oxygen delivery, it needs to dilate. Coronary endothelial cells are responsible for the production of nitric oxide, a gaseous molecule that works locally to promote vasodilation. Follow those gaseous exhaust particles down to the corner of the sketch, and you'll see our recurring GMP grump. Nitric oxide increases cyclic GMP inside arteriolar smooth muscle cells. More GMP means relaxation and vasodilation, that should get the oxygen flowing. Adenosine is the other important vasodilator at work here. <sighs> and it looks like the blacksmith's apprentice is slacking off yet again. What is it this time? Dancing with the hot local villager chick, is it? That's dancing for adenosine, by the way. Just look at those dilated red arterial sleeves. So that's the name of the game. Vasodilation. You can't just increase blood pressure and cram more blood into the coronary arteries. The coronaries have a built-in mechanism called autoregulation that keeps the blood flow constant across a range of pressures. That's the area where the coronary flow graph plateaus. See that flat line there? Yep, it's a finely tuned machine. If you need more flow, you gotta dilate. In case you haven't noticed, that forge in the back is looking a little dim. It's time to introduce ischemic heart disease, the pathologic state that occurs when there's a mismatch between myocardial oxygen demand and coronary oxygen supply. You just can't get enough oxygen flowing, for various reasons. In most of the world, atherosclerotic obstruction of one or more coronary arteries is the most common cause of myocardial ischemia. This is called coronary artery disease. Just look at all that gross, gunky stuff lodged in the nitric oxide exhaust pipe. Atherosclerosis doesn't only obstruct luminal flow. It actually impairs the ability of the endothelial cells to release nitric oxide and other vasodilators. So, try as it might to increase flow, the coronary artery remains pathologically constricted. Not to mention, your autoregulatory mechanisms are all thrown off. With all that atherosclerosis in there, the overall coronary blood flow redlines a lot sooner. 
remember, you just can't dilate anymore. So lots of dilation available? That means lots of flow and a happy, oxygenated heart. Not so much dilation? Well, you're left with this. Disappointing, right? Take a close look, and you'll notice that only the very outside of this heart-shaped metal frame is oxygenated. That's because it's the innermost myocardial layer, the subendocardium, that gets ischemic first. It's like an improperly microwaved hot pocket. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. It gets cold and ischemic, and is rife with icy ham chunks. Before we see what this cellular ischemia is doing to those cardiac myocytes on a molecular level, let's draw in a few more mechanisms that impair the ability of the coronaries to deliver oxygen. You see, patients with ischemic heart disease usually have atherosclerosis contributing to reduced coronary flow. But, more often than not, there's another event on top of that which exacerbates the mismatch between oxygen supply and myocardial oxygen demand. And bam! Their heart gets ischemic causing the classic pain and pressure associated with angina. It's all about oxygen supply and demand. Cardiac myocytes have to work harder. For example, when there's too much afterload. At Sketchy, afterload is depicted by someone pushing against a load. It's what the heart has to push through before it can eject its contents. Well, the princess is getting a little impatient waiting for that metal frame to heat up. It's a new harp for her birthday, by the way. Delayed yet again. Pfft. Medieval world problems. What are you going to do? Increased afterload occurs in the setting of aortic stenosis, as depicted by that stenotic cone-shaped aortic hat, as well as hypertension. Just look at that steam. Too much afterload causes stress on the myocardium and increased oxygen demand. What about oxygen supply? Recall from our congestive heart failure sketches that pressure overload states lead to concentric myocardial hypertrophy, as depicted by the bulky layers of that conch-centric conch shell. Well, coronary arteries find it hard to penetrate all the way through that hypertrophied wall. That means decreased blood supply. High demand and reduced supply? That's a recipe for ischemia. It's the same with tachycardia. More contractions means more work increasing oxygen demand. Interestingly, oxygen supply from the coronaries is inhibited as well. You see, the left ventricle is so muscular that when it contracts, the coronaries feeding it get all compressed and constricted. During diastole, however, the coronaries are opened and flowing. That's when the left ventricle gets to breathe, so to speak. See how the left side of the queen's dress is emblazoned with our recurring diastolic diamonds? As you can tell, the kingdom revolves around the princess, and the queen is getting a little worried about making it to the birthday party on time. As those diastolic diamonds fall underneath that elevated heart watch, remember that diastolic time is decreased in the setting of tachycardia. That means decreased coronary flow to the left ventricle and an exacerbation of ischemia. And that's why your patient with coronary artery disease feels angina symptoms when he exercises. Increased heart rate and contractility means too much oxygen demand. And the less diastolic filling time during tachycardia means less oxygen supply. Better slow down there, fella. Drugs can play a role as well. Think of cocaine, for example, a potent sympathomimetic. And, as always, it's represented by an arousing serving of hot cocoa. All those extra catecholamines floating around will increase heart rate and contractility really taking myocardial oxygen demand to the next level. But supply is impeded as well. Just look at the small constricted coronary crown of our neglected prince here. Caught in the crossfire, cocaine actually causes coronary artery constriction, mediated primarily through stimulation of the alpha adrenergic receptors. Cocaine-induced ischemia can be so severe that the heart sustains a full-on myocardial infarction. More about that in the next couple videos. And lastly, less common causes of cardiac ischemia include syndromes that involve systemic hypooxygenation, like hypotension, shock, anemia, or carbon monoxide poisoning. Hence the anemic, hypoperfused face. Really need to get out of the workshop more, my friend. Work on that ghostly complexion. All right, 
Let's zoom in on a single cardiac myocyte and illustrate what all this ischemia is doing to the cell. Ugh, take a look at the princess's favorite harp there. In dire need of some repair. As a result, the whole kingdom has been put on hold. Remember, cardiac myocytes depend on a constant delivery of oxygenated blood in order to power oxidative phosphorylation. In the setting of ischemia, the functional effects are felt almost immediately. We're talking within seconds here. What happened? Well, an ischemic myocyte immediately switches from aerobic glycolysis to anaerobic glycolysis. Eventually, there's just not enough ATP to go around. So, right as the king hands that harp over, doink, out falls those ATP batteries responsible for powering the cell. In under a minute, the ischemic myocyte loses its ability to contract, as depicted by those strings stuck in that non-contractile state. On the exam, they'll call it something like myofibril relaxation. Without ATP, crossbridge formation is halted in seconds. And if this happens to enough cells, a whole portion of the ventricle just doesn't want to move, and cardiac output falls. Let's keep focusing on a single cardiac myocyte, however, and look at a few more pathologic changes that occur within the ischemic cell over the next few minutes. On the test, watch out for terms like glycogen depletion, clumping of chromatin, as well as cellular and mitochondrial swelling. This is all depicted by our next instrument repairman. You've got a depleted glycogen candy bar, some kind of chromatin clumping in that other pocket there, I guess. And come to think of it, just an overall puffy and swollen complexion. Don't worry though, cellular swelling and other early changes are actually reversible. That's right. As this repairman restrings the instrument with a shiny new red harp string, imagine a cardiovascular surgeon opening up that coronary artery and returning blood flow back to those ischemic cells. If ischemia is allowed to persist for about 30 minutes, however, the damage becomes irreversible. At this point, it's considered infarction and coagulation necrosis begins to take place. The major pathologic change that signals irreversible damage at the cellular level is what's called mitochondrial vacuolization. Just look at this mitochondrial loot here, discarded because it was beyond repair. Let that hole in the center of the instrument remind you of the vacuoles that form within each mitochondrion. Notice the ruptured side of the loot as well. Any time they mention cellular membrane rupture or organelle rupture or mitochondrial membrane damage, you're looking at irreversible cell injury. In fact, when that myocyte cell membrane breaks down, that's when the cell starts leaking its contents, including the molecules troponin and creatine kinase. Both are represented here by this overturned trash can. The contents of which include our recurring creatine kinase crispy chicken bucket, as well as a few troponin T-bone steaks. Give it enough time, and you can actually detect these molecules in the serum. In the next sketch, we'll show you how CK and troponin serum levels are used to clinically diagnose and monitor acute ischemic events. Aw, would you look at that? All better. If myocardial blood flow is restored before irreversible injury occurs, cell viability is preserved. Good as new. This is the rationale for early diagnosis of heart attack. The goal is to restore blood flow to the affected area as quickly as possible to try and salvage as much of the myocardium as we can. This can be accomplished with thrombolytics, angioplasty, or coronary artery bypass grafts. However, even if blood flow is returned to areas of ischemic myocardium before the ischemia becomes irreversible, there's a delay in time before the overall contraction returns to normal. This phenomenon is known as stunned myocardium. See how stunned she is? Just frozen with excitement and disbelief? Myocardial stunning typically lasts a few hours to days after restoration of blood flow, leading to persistent wall motion abnormalities and diminished ejection fraction. As far as we know, however, this doesn't have any long-term impact on myocardial function. All right, so your patient is back from surgery and blood is rushing back into those areas of cellular ischemia. Sadly, any cells that have already undergone irreversible damage are gone for good. Here's the thing though, even reversibly damaged cells aren't off the hook just yet. 
Paradoxically, you can actually do further damage to myocytes by restoring blood flow to areas of ischemia. This phenomenon is called ischemia reperfusion injury. Let me show you what I mean. See this ruptured heart lute? By restringing it, we've damaged it even more. During the ischemic period, intracellular calcium increases due to impaired calcium cycling and damage to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Upon reperfusion, that buildup of intracellular calcium results in what's called hypercontracture, as evoked by the hypercontracted strings here. Hypercontracture can cause further cytoskeletal damage and death of surrounding cells, and that area of heart tissue becomes stuck in a contracted state. Not only that, within minutes of reperfusion, a bunch of free radicals are produced by the affected area, including superoxides and hydrogen peroxide. Just think of this repairman here, sending oxidizing sparks in all directions as he helps with the revascularization procedure. I mean, I like his enthusiasm and all, but this is only causing further damage to surrounding myocytes. And a small fire has started. Ugh, just great. It turns out that reperfusion actually introduces more inflammatory cells to the area, including neutrophils. While these guys are normally responsible for lysing dead cells and cleaning up the debris, neutrophils can start destroying viable myocytes as well. Not to mention all those cytokines they're releasing, ramping up inflammation. All in all, reperfusion injury involves free radical damage, inflammation, and further irreversible mitochondrial damage. See that ruptured mitochondrion? When mitochondria release their contents, the cell heads down a path of apoptosis. It's been suggested that reperfusion injury accounts for up to 50% of the final myocardial damage seen after a heart attack. All right, so far we've been emphasizing the immediate cellular changes that occur within cardiac myocytes during acute ischemic episodes. Look at that chronically ischemic grandfather clock in the back though. What if the myocardium instead faces a more long-term subclinical ischemia? This is dubbed chronic ischemic heart disease and is sometimes called ischemic cardiomyopathy. It's not a true cardiomyopathy like the hypertrophic, dilated, and restrictive versions we've covered earlier in the unit. Instead, it's essentially just another name for the progressive heart failure that occurs secondary to long-term ischemic myocardial damage. In most instances, there's a history of previous MI. See how the old loot frame there has patches all over from years of repaired damage? The myocardium often looks the same, with discrete areas of scarring from previous healed infarcts. Sometimes you'll hear the term patchy fibrosis. More rarely, there's no sign of previous infarct at all. It's merely severe obstructive coronary artery disease causing diffuse myocardial dysfunction. In either case, areas of residual viable myocardium just can't take the workload anymore, and the heart begins to fail. So we've included our recurring floppy heart failure balloon. This is exactly what we illustrated in our congestive heart failure sketch. Cardiac ischemia leads to systolic dysfunction with dilated chambers due to eccentric hypertrophy. Big and dilated, just like this instrument frame here. The loot that nobody wanted. Frickin' sad, man. Okay, hear me out, hear me out. What if? Your patient comes in with a chronically ischemic heart, like the one we just described. It's all floppy and doesn't work anymore. Are you going to just give up? Well, what if I told you that you can wake up some of the cells, eh? And get that heart pumping again. Imagine that a patient has fairly significant blockages in their coronary arteries, to the point where there's reduced coronary artery blood flow even at rest, but not obstructed enough to cause outright infarction. Over time, the heart can actually compensate for this oxygen supply-demand mismatch by decreasing its contractility and decreasing the overall oxygen demand by the myocardial tissue. The cells kinda hibernate, like this bear here. When blood flow is restored to those areas of heart tissue that have been dormant, let's say I put a stent in their left coronary artery, or a bypass graft, or, no, oh, let's say I just spray it with this vascular hose, However you go about waking a bear discreetly, I guess. All of a sudden, these sleeping cells recover. 
and they return to their normal workload and oxygen demand. It's called hibernating myocardium. Overall, the ejection fraction improves a bit, and the patient's heart failure symptoms can be reduced. All right, time to sum up ischemic heart disease into a few important points. Getting blood to the heart is all about coronary artery vasodilation. The two most important local factors involved are nitric oxide and those adenosine dancers. Over at the dim forge, remember that the subendocardial zone usually feels ischemia first, just like the cold, dark center of that underheated heart frame. It's all about an oxygen supply-demand mismatch, and in most patients, there's a supply problem involving atherosclerosis of one or more coronary arteries. How does the cardiac myocyte feel about all this? In seconds, it starts running out of ATP and stops contracting. In minutes, it loses its glycogen, clumps its chromatin, and looks a little swollen around the midsection. These are all reversible cellular changes. All you gotta do is revascularize, and you'll be just fine. If you wait too long, though, you start running into irreversible damage, which includes vacuolization of mitochondria and membrane rupture. All right, so we reperfusion the area, right? Now we've got more problems. The free radical sparks start flying, the inflammation ramps up, and some cells will even hypercontract, leading to more irreversible myocyte damage. That's called reperfusion injury. What if the myocardium faces a more long-term ischemia? I'm talking over years here. Eventually, it can progress to systolic heart failure and get all big and dilated with patchy fibrosis from years of previous infarcts. But maybe, just maybe, at least some of those cells are salvageable. They're just hibernating in a powered down, low oxygen usage state, and a revascularization procedure is the only thing that will wake them up. Oh no, a bear got in the loot workshop again. Oh no, the Black Death has wiped out over half the population, including everyone I love. Pfft. Medieval world problems. Check out our other topics on YouTube or go to sketchy.com for our full suite of MCAT and med school lessons. Thanks for listening and stay sketchy out there.